Good stuff from Cam Underwood, State of the U. So we're carving through some comments and trying to build themes here and collect hundreds of comments and um, hit those topics that you're bringing up the most. So the next one involves Mark Richt as well, Cam. And it's almost on two levels. Number one, Mark Richt is a hire to Miami as the head coach, the CEO. And is he a top level guy in that position? His record would mostly speak to that. He was a consistent winner at Georgia. Like his teams never fell off to six and seven, seven and six. They were nine and four at worst. A lot of 10 and 11 win seasons. Did he win championships? He got to SEC championship games. Uh, he won a couple of them. So on one hand, on one level, I'm posing the the comfort of the hire from the standpoint of bringing Miami back to the top and the elite of college football. I know it's there from a relevant standpoint, from but from actually winning the games in your comfort level and confidence in Mark Richt from a CEO standpoint. And then also as an offensive coordinator and his ability to play call. And I don't know if you can touch upon that just based on 2016 or what you would like to see out of him in 2017 that would give you more confidence uh, in that area of his of his uh, skill set. Yeah, those are good questions, obviously. You know, uh, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm at, I'm ecstatic that Mark Rick is our is our, yeah, the Miami Hurricanes head coach. Um, I think that it was a strong hire. I think that was a power move um, by the University of Miami. And I think that giving the increased budget to build out the assistant staff was the other component of that power move. Um, obviously, um, when he was at Texas, his last defense there was quite bad. But I think that was emblematic of a lot of things at the University of Texas wholesale, not just him. Um, as you see, that whole staff got fired and then Charlie Strong, the next staff got fired as well. So that's how deep seated I think those um, issues were. I think that Manny Diaz got screwed for uh, being nominated for the Broyles Award for one of the top or the top assistant coach in uh, college football last year, uh, plain and simple. Uh, Miami, the development on defense was spectacular. And being able to get a guy like that and keep him here uh, for another year is big. Craig Kuligowski, a defensive line coach for my money, the best defensive line coach in America, he's here. A couple NFL teams, most notably or reportedly the Atlanta Falcons, reached out to him saying, hey, look, we have a defensive line coach opening. Why don't you step up to the NFL level? What did Miami do? Miami made him associate head coach, paid him more money. He's staying in Coral Gables. It's things like that beyond, below the, the headline, head coach level that also matter. Um, so I think that whole commitment from the University of Miami to Mark Rick, his paradigm, and his staff, I think that that was just a, a home run. It was exactly what we needed. We'd gone out on the um, kind of – on a limb, a couple of, well, a few times in a row. Larry Coker, never been a head coach, promote him for continuity. It makes sense. I get it. Um, Randy Shannon, never been a head coach before, promote him for continuity and thought he was going to be great. I was one of those million people who thought he was going to be great in Miami. He wasn't. Cool. You go from him to, you know, Al Golden, who when the initial uh, report came out, everybody said, who? What? You know, and then all of a sudden the next hire is Mark Rick. Oh, I know him. That's name brand. That's the kind of thing that we should be doing. Um, so I, I am 100% on board with the hire, uh, even through the first year. Yes, we did lose some games because, you know, everybody in America literally lost a game last year. Uh, so there was no unbeaten and untied team. Um, so to have undefeated as the expectation in year one, realistically, uh, I think was outlandish. But nine and four with a bowl win for the first time in a decade, that's proof positive that things are trending in the right direction. Now, to the other part of that first question about Mark Rick being a CEO, he's not the CEO anymore. Okay, when he was at Georgia, the CEO is, I sit at the top of the organization, and basically, I outsource or I delegate the rest of the duties to pretty much everybody else, and I'm the figurehead. I'm the, that was what Bobby Bowden was at Florida State. That's what Mark Rick was at Georgia, where he was there, but he wasn't in the trenches. He wasn't calling plays. He wasn't in the quarterback meeting room. He wasn't doing all those things. He was, for lack of a better term, he was a figurehead. So he was less integrated into the everyday running and you know operation of the program. He openly said when he was fired from Georgia, 
I don't want to do that anymore. I'm getting back to my roots. When I first got to Georgia and I was calling plays, when I was at Florida State and I was calling plays, you know, things like that, where I'm really integrated into the system. So, yeah, Mark Rich is a head coach, but he's not taking that CEO uh, style of, you know, program uh, organization anymore. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad that he's a head coach and I'm glad that he's not doing the CEO thing anymore because the CEO route and the way that he was doing it at Georgia was what led him to be fired. So I think that him being in the, in the trenches more with everybody is better for the entire program. And if you look up uh, on the website now, stateofview.com, if you look at the day two of spring practice recap, I want to say um, the Miami Hurricanes athletics mic'd up Mark Rick for practice and they put up that video uh, and you can just hear how he's talking to so many different guys um, during a passing drill, obviously quarterback, you know, kind of guy he's, you know, who played quarterback at Miami, by the way. I mean, he was a quarterback. He didn't really play a lot, but I mean, when you have hall of famers in front of you, what are you going to do? Um, but you know, he's watching uh, one of the quarterbacks throw and he's talking because he, he his head turns, he goes good rep two seven, and I'm like, what? Who's two seven? That's Ryan Mays, who's a fourth string defensive back on the other field, you know. And he's like, so that's how much he's paying attention. That's how much he's integrated. He's not just up in his office like overseeing practice. He's on the field right behind that quarterback, but aware enough to know that this guy on this other field is doing a good job. That's the kind of connection to the program that I don't think that he had in the second half of his tenure at Georgia. So that kind of a thing makes me happy. That's what I want to see. I think that's his best fit uh, as a coach. And I think he's doing a lot better with that. Now to the other question, Mark Richt as play caller. I think that there's development that needs to, to happen. I think that he was rusty when he did it last year because it was the first time that he had called plays in about eight, nine years. So it's, you know, one thing to do it in theory, you're in the meeting room, but then when you have, you know, warm bodies on a field running around really fast, things kind of change. Um, you know, I think that some of what he wants to do was handicapped a little bit by the lack of mobility that um, Brad Kaya had or didn't have. I, I don't even know. Um, Brad Kaya couldn't run. End of story. So that kind of handicapped a little bit of what he wants to do uh, with the quarterback mobility-wise. And now – all these guys on campus and all these guys in the uh, quarterback battle, and even Nikosi Perry, who's not on campus, but he will be in that battle. All these guys can move. And I'm not saying that they're, you know, 2003 Mike Vick run for 1,200 yards in the NFL can run, but they're less statuesque than Brad Pye. And I think that that will open up a lot of things in the playbook. I think that will open up some things in the um, RPO, the run pass option series, where you can have an actual read option, you know, where the quarterback is a live component of that run game, as opposed to every read option just ends up being inside zone to the running back because they know that the quarterback is not going to run. I think Brad Kaya kept it on the read option literally twice last year. And I think, and I know one of those was in the bowl game and the other one might have been against Pittsburgh towards the end of the regular season. Um, you know, so if you have that, threat of a running quarterback where he might keep it for you know 10 yards on a third and nine twice a game that opens up things in the rpo series and i know that a run pass option is not 100 percent a zone read option play however that is a component of that series of plays that part of your playbook that now becomes live i think that you know, with a better handle on the talent and getting recruiting to bring in the guys that he wants and needs on this team, the kind of guys, I think that will strengthen what Mark Rick is able to do from a play calling perspective. Case in point, the offensive line last year took a step forward, was not as abjectly terrible as 2015, but was still not great, especially when faced with top tier opponents. Now you bring in five offensive linemen in this class and you have player development for those guys who are on campus. You get a George Brown, a four-star recruit transferred in from LSU, sat out last year. He's now eligible. You have Tyree St. Louis, now a junior, four-star recruit, played a lot at right tackle after Sonny Odogu got injured. So you're looking for player development there. Sonny Odogu, when he comes back from his knee injury, you're looking for maybe development there. Navon Donaldson, a four-star recruit as a freshman. Now he steps in and he can get playing time at guard or tackle as a true freshman. Now, by having those four guys at tackle, and I mean, yeah, one of those 
you know, Brown was a transfer who came in after Rick got hired. Donaldson was a recruit in last year in this past recruiting class. Now you add, so you double those kind of the numbers at tackle to go with the Tyree St. Louis, to go with the Sonny Adago, who's 6'8", 2, sorry, 335 pounds. Now, instead of having to play Trevor Darling out of position at left tackle, you can kick him inside the guard. Now you can put Casey McDermott at the other guard. Now you can find your best lineman who's not one of those guys and put him at center. So even with just that little bit of connection, things change. So now if you have a, a more talented offensive line, now the run game becomes a viable part of the game plan when you're playing anybody. You know, you saw our run game last year. My, I mean, we went up against Florida State, and Florida State has one of the top five defensive lines in America. I'm not saying you're going to run for 300 yards against them, but, man, the running game got taken completely away. You look at other teams, they're selling out. That gets taken completely away. So now you have a better offensive line. That run game, you want to run power. You want to run ISO. You want to uh, want to run inside, outside zone, stretch. You want to run any of those things. You have the offensive line that can do that. Now a Mark Rick-based offense wants to run the ball 60, 65% of the time. Now you're going to be successful. Hit your success rates. Shout out to Bill Connolly from SB Nation, one of my colleagues who does a great job with analytics, talking about what a success rate is in passing and running. You should look that up. It's really good stuff. So now you're going to hit your success rates, i.e. get enough yards to stay on schedule. Now that opens up more in your play action game. If your RPO game goes, if you have guys with speed, Amon Richards, freshman All-American, didn't have 1,000 yards last year, could have 1,000 yards this year. You bring in a Jeff Thomas, arguably the fastest player in this last recruiting class from East St. Louis, if he qualifies. You bring in Mike Harley. You bring back a Lawrence Cager. Now, because of that, a lot of things have changed. So I think that there can be things where – Mark Richt wanted to do some things last year as a play caller, but the limitations of the talent on the team precluded him from doing that. By recruiting up front, by changing the offensive line, and hopefully by increasing their talent. Also, shout out to Stacey Searles, the offensive line coach, who did a great job coaching, did a great job recruiting. And I didn't even mention Kyleon Herbert from American Heritage High School, who's another four-star recruit who will not be an early enrollee, but he could integrate himself into the conversation for playing time at guard or tackle from day one. So you just have all these things. So, you know, I think with Mark Rick kind of having a um, kind of a chem lab year, you know, where you go in and you experiment on some things. You have a spontaneous combustion lab. You have a salinity lab. You do all those kind of things. Say, OK, well, this is the way that I should do this because this is the way that this works best for me and our program. Now, when you spin that back forward, OK, we're going to obviously throw Amon Richards the ball. That should be number one. Like, or, well, give Mark Walton the ball throw Amon Richards the ball. That should be one and one A in the offense, obviously. Then you build out on top of that. I think that this year of experience for him getting back in the trenches of calling plays is going to be a good thing. 